difficulties these days. Lord, you can read my heart. You know how much we love you and how much we desire your help in our lives. The scripture this morning is found in 1 Samuel 30, verses 1 to 6. Three days later, when David and his men arrived home at their town of Ziklag, they found that the Amalekites had made a raid into the Negev and Ziklag. They had crushed Ziklag and burned it to the ground. They had carried off the women and children and everyone else, but without killing anyone. When David and his men saw the ruins and realized what had happened to their families, they wept until they could weep no more. David's two wives, Ahinoam from Jezreel and Abigail the widow of Nabal from Carmel, were among those captured. David was now in great danger because all his men were very bitter about losing their sons and daughters, and they began to talk of stoning him. But here's the clincher. But David found strength in the Lord his God. And that's where we find our help and our strength too, isn't it? Lord, we just ask you to help us to open up our hearts and hear you speak to our hearts. Lord, help us to learn about encouraging ourselves in your name. Bless Pastor as he preaches this special word to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Ellie. You may be seated. Encouraging yourself in the Lord. That is something that in this day in which we live, we perhaps need more than other days because we're in those last days before Jesus is coming. And the Word of God tells us it's the days of Noah. There aren't many godly people out there that are proclaiming the word of God. There are churches, and there are loads of churches, but some do not promote Jesus Christ as the only way to salvation. They do not give you the entire word of God, and therefore they do not lead people to Jesus Christ. Then there are the few that are, and some major ones that are, and we thank God for them. But my friends, we need more old-fashioned Bible teaching and preaching because that's what's going to encourage us when we go through trials and tribulations. I begin this message with a familiar word from the Word of God in 1 Samuel 30, verse 6. And David was greatly distressed. He wasn't literally distressed. He was greatly distressed. There were things that happened to him that caused him to have less courage and much fear. It had uh, just happened that he had just returned from a tremendous victory. You know, that's when Satan loves to hit, when something great happens in your life and you are on a high level of response to God's word, then Satan comes and he attacks and he attacks to try to get you to be depressed and not to be encouraged. Well, that's exactly what he did in the account that we're reading about today. He had just come and heard the king a king Agash, and this king actually had said to him these words before he returned home to find the problem. He said, Thou art good in my sight, an angel of God. He had been represented as God's ambassador, God's messenger. That's what an angel is. It's a messenger from God. And the reality is that God had Given, given him tremendous victory, not a little bit of victory, but tremendous victory. And he was returning with the praises of this king and the people that he represented. And when he returned, he found that the city he lived in was burnt to the ground. Their homes were totally destroyed and their children and wives were gone. A high point where God used him greatly, but a low point 
where he now is going to have to go through a test? Would he give up? Would he say, I'm so discouraged by what I see that I'm going to forget all that happened over here under God's power? Does that remind you of Elijah? Elijah defeated the prophets of Baal. Great victory. And then Jezebel says, you're going to be dead. And he flees for his life. And he asks God to take him. It seems after every great victory in your life and in my life, you can expect Satan is going to throw something at you. And you need to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, and not give in to discouragement, for that is not the will of God. We must fight discouragement in every situation. Now, David was in this terrible situation. The Amalekites, it says, had invaded while they were away, having this victory, and taken all the precious things in that village captive and also their very families. I think they could have made it if they hadn't taken the families. Think of it, your wife whom you love, your husband who you love, in your case if you're a woman, the children all taken away and you didn't know what they were going to do with them maybe sell them into slavery, maybe just plain kill them. And you said, what is happening, God? We've just had your victory. Why have you allowed this to happen in our lives? Well, the word of God says this was a horrible day for him. He was depressed and he was terribly depressed. And any one of us could say, yes, I would be depressed in that situation because I've had depressing situations in my life. But what is he going to finally do? Well, the word of God says in 1 Samuel 30, verse 4, and David and the people that were with him lifted up their voices and wept. All the soldiers that came back had lost their wives and children, and they wept. Now, that was good. They got the weeping because they had they'd gone through a terrible thing, and weeping does release you. They wept, it says, until they could weep no more. The best thing a person can do when they've gone through a trial and it is overwhelming is to get it out, to get it out. If you don't get it out in weeping, you'll get it out in anger. And if you get it out in anger, you're going to hurt a lot of people. But you must, you must get rid of that terrible sorrow before it takes you over and destroys you. Well, not only did they weep, but then they thought, it's David's fault. It's David's fault. If David wasn't doing what he was doing, the Amalekites would not have come and taken our families. So they rose up, it said, in anger, and they wanted to stone David. If they don't deal with it in their own lives, they'll want to hurt somebody else. You see, when you live in discouragement, after a while you're going to blame somebody for that discouragement. You're going to make someone that's innocent pay for your discouragement because it's usually, by the way, somebody you love the most, somebody that you can hurt the most. And you're trying to strike out at them because you have not dealt with the problem in your own life. You can't admit that it's you that needs prayer. I like that old song, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother nor my sister, not anyone, but it's me that needs you to work in my life. So they rose up to Stone David. David himself was torn with grief over his loss. 
he wanted to die just as much as they wanted to kill him. You see, the point is he led them away from protecting their people to the victory that took place in another town, another city. But meanwhile, their own family suffered. Did this calamity fall on David because he was living in some sin? A hundred times no. It was not because he was living in sin at all. God was working in David's life to make him a better man of God, a more dedicated man of God than he's ever been before. And you say, how can that be? Can God use your discouragement and your defeat and your trial to make you more mature and more reliant upon God? God seems to kick all my support systems out so that I cannot rely upon myself. We have just done a major repair on the church for this church. And there's a certain amount of money that has to be paid. And we are believing in the impossible. God's going to give it to us. Will God give it to us or will God not give it to us? It's up to our God. But the reason I say that is whether he does or does not will not enter us into discouragement. It will enter us into a deeper faith and reliance on God either way. But you see, if you don't believe God for anything that's beyond yourself, then you certainly are not going to make it in this life. I believe God for my daily finances. I believe God for my outstanding bills if I have any. I believe God for the church's success, whether there are multitudes here or few here. I believe God when he says, get on the Internet and you'll reach many more people for Christ and your ministry will become a worldwide ministry. I believe God. When you believe God for the impossible, the impossible takes place. And it's amazing what God has done because we prayed for the impossible and God has honored many of our prayers with a yes and a few with a no. The Word of God says David probably wondered why, why. And in your problem and in my problem, you say, why, God? Why are you giving me one trial after another, one problem after another? I just get through one, and I see that you have given me the success in that one, and then another one comes to give me a trial. How many do you think I can take, God? And God says, more than you think, more than you think. We must ask the question often, why God? But we must listen to the answer as well. It's not evil to ask God why. It's evil not to listen to him when he tells you why. And when you can't understand what he's saying to you is contrary to what you want. But we must listen. If you'll notice number one on the screen, what does a child of God do when discouragement sets in and he or she feels useless like a complete failure, abandoned by God and rejected by those who once cared? Do you see? That's what David is thinking. God, why? And then not only why, why has everyone turned against me? Even my familiar friends have turned against me, said Jesus. The apostle Paul, when he was in prison, many turned against him. They did not want to be associated with him. 
if you're going to be used of God, many will turn against you when they don't understand why something has happened in their life. And you prayed, but it didn't help them at all. They will say, what's going on? You must not be a man or woman of God because God didn't answer your prayers the way I wanted them to be uh, answered. So they feel like they're a complete failure, those that have that experience, abandoned by God and rejected by those who once cared. Believe it or not, God was in this apparent tragedy. God was in this apparent tragedy with all that city being burnt and the families being carried away. God is in your tragedy and in my tragedy more than we even imagine. If we can see from heaven's perspective why all the things are happening that we've asked the question why to God, then we would say, thank you, God. We see a tapestry unfinished. God sees one that's completely finished. And I can assure you that are going through one trial after another and you're saying, why, why, why? When you see it from God's perspective, you're going to praise him for the trial. For it drew you so much closer to God so that all that you had was God. The doctors failed. The finances fail. The health fails. Everything seems to fail, and you're a great servant of God. And then you say, why, why? And God says, wait a while, I'll show you why. But it's now the time to live by faith. Number two, if David is to become the man of God, that he really uses, and if you're to become the man or woman of God that God wants to use in a greater way in these last days, then listen, he must be, David, stripped of everything. Everything you've depended upon has to be taken away, including his reputation and his self-will. The only way God could use this servant is by taking away everything that would puff him up. And certainly he does that. The only thing that can keep a servant following God when everything is taken away from them, whether it be a pastor or the people in the congregation, is they get closer to Jesus than they've ever been before. They rely on Jesus a lot more than they ever relied on Jesus before. They lived a godly life, but now they're really experiencing a deeper walk with God because that's all they have. If the solution is going to come, it's going to come from God's grace and God's mercy. So everything has to be stripped of a servant of God before God can say, now I can speak through you because you're not trying to gain a reputation. You're not trying to give somebody a good thought about you. You're simply my servant, and you'll be my servant better than you've ever been before because it, nothing matters but Jesus Christ to you now and his kingdom. Number three. That servant, and David had to learn this, must learn to stand alone. No one else in the family stands with you, but you're going to stand with Christ no matter what. Nobody else believes in, in the impossible, but you have chosen to believe the, in the impossible and believe God is going to not give you a stone He must stand alone, dependent on God only, finding all he needed through personal communion and affection of the Lord. 
we sing and we sing it as children. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And yet, do we really believe Jesus loves us when everything goes wrong? Did David believe that God loved him even when he was in despondency and everyone had turned against him? Did Job believe that God was supreme when he got all those terrible things that happened to him and even his wife was sick and tired of seeing him suffer so she wanted him to die? I mean, everything turned against Job, but he said, I will yet see God even if he destroys me in my flesh. I will see God. He didn't give up. He didn't give up. And it says in the latter verses of Job that he actually became a stronger man of God than he ever was before. Through the trial, through the trial, because in the trial, all he had was God. His friends misunderstood him. They accused him. Nobody stood with him but God stood there in silence, and he waited on God. So it is with David in this terrible situation. He had no one to turn to. He couldn't turn to his army because they hated him and blamed him. He couldn't turn to anybody, even his wife, because she was held captive. All he had was God, but God was enough. God was enough even when we have nothing else to hold on to, God has to be enough. Are we willing to learn from David's experience? How are we going to say that was David's experience? Therefore, I'm different. No, you're not. What God had to do with David, he has to do with every single believer that's serious about God. Those that are believers that aren't serious about God, they're already useless. They'll enter the kingdom but without rewards. Without a well done, thou good and faithful servant, but the child of God that allows God to go, th let them go through these things and trust God in spite of it and ask God to give them the encouragement they need and the strength they need to be more than a conqueror in their situation, that individual receives well done. Thou good and faithful servant, you have been faithful in a few things that I tossed your way. You may think it's a lot of things, but it's not. It's a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Heaven is coming, and what you and I are doing are preparing ourselves for the rulership that God has promised to those that love him, that love him. So he gets us to depend on him. Will we recognize the reason for our hardships Will we really recognize why we're going through these horrible situations? And all those that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer not only persecutions, but trials and tribulations. Why? will never be answered probably on this earth. But I assure you, why won't even be in the question mark for heaven, but if you want to know, God will show you why. I dare you to show me a single Christian, and I want you to think about this for a moment, a single Christian who is wholly devoted to the Lord, who has an easy, trouble-free life. Why should we expect different than most of Christianity that has suffered the cause of Jesus Christ for committing their whole life to Jesus. To not make friends, but 
to give people the opportunity to be saved by the blood of the Lamb. Note number four, if you will. Show me a spirit-led, God-filled, anointed servant of the Lord, and I'll show you one who has been chased, chastened, often baffled. They don't know why it's happening. And familiar with deep waters and fiery furnaces. If you are spirit-led, a lot of Christians aren't, you know. They're led by their emotions. They're led by their feelings. They're led by somebody's persuasion. But are you led by the Spirit of God? Does God show you how to live, how to talk, how to reveal Christ to people, how to put down discouragement when discouragement is normal? Spirit-led is the only way you can have success. God-filled. How many people see Christ in you? Or do they see complaining? Do they see unbelief? Do they see all the things that are natural in the flesh? Or do they see somebody that believes in God and will not lay down and let the devil take over? The more the devil attacks, the more I want to attack him. And how do I attack the devil? By believing the word of God, walking in the light as he's in the light. I will not ever, by the grace of God, give in to the devil's attacks. And he has attacked, not only personally, but in my wife, in the church. He has attacked time and time again. I have spent sleepless nights because of his attack. But then God came through for me and I recognized how foolish it was to ever spend one moment listening to the devil attack. Now most of you that are watching my TV, you think we're filled to capacity. We have about eight people here in the ministry today. Less than 20 most of the time. That's why we don't pan the audience. There isn't any. But God has taught me, you and those here are the ones God wants me to give the word out to, and he has given us that opportunity. Am I discouraged? I used to be. Now I look at your faces and how can you be in, how can you be discouraged with such beautiful faces? God's wonderful people. You see deeper than you see on the surface. You see people that know God and are walking by faith and won't give up because they have committed themselves to Jesus Christ. Friends, we remain on this channel, Facebook, public access, YouTube, because of faith in God and because of your faithfulness to watch us. The Word of God makes it very clear, friends. If you are serving God, don't expect a carefree life. I know a lot of people, they tell you to go to the mission field, and hundreds of people are waiting for you to tell them about Jesus. And I've met enough missionaries to know hundreds are not waiting for you to tell them about Jesus. They hop from one mission field to another because so few want the Word of God in the world today. And perhaps you've experienced that if you're listening to this in another country. So few. And why shouldn't they? The Word of God says we're in the Laodicean church age and people are not hot. They're either lukewarm or cold. They can take it or leave it. 
Well, I've decided I don't like lukewarm. I talked about that last week in regard to coffee. If it's not hot, you can keep it. But I can tell you this, lukewarm Christianity is even more nauseating. They're not on fire for Christ. You ought to come to this church, you'd find a few that are by the grace of Almighty God. So they find themselves in all kinds of fiery furnaces because they will not turn their back on Jesus Christ. They will suffer the cause of living for Jesus. The Word of God says in Ephesians 3.16, Paul is writing that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. God wants us to be strengthened, not weakened by the devil's attacks. He wants us to be strengthened by it. Note number five, we are living in a day which the Lord needs Christians who are not tossed by every wind or wave of doctrine, teaching that is, who are not being merchandised of. We live in a day when we need solid Bible Christians, people that know the Word of God, live by the Word of God, and tell people the Word of God whether they like it or not. We live in a day when if you don't shock them into eternity, you're not going to get them, most of them, to come to a faith in Jesus Christ. How often have you ever heard a pastor recently preach on hell? I can think of one that has on television, but most of them stay away from that subject. They need to be shocked into reality. Hell is not a place where you're going to have a hell of a time. You're going to be tormented forever and ever and ever. And the only way you can escape it is by receiving Jesus Christ into your life, repenting of your sin and letting Jesus give you his salvation. That's the only way. And if you're not going to go that way, you're going to end up in eternal damnation, eternal judgment. It isn't for a moment. It isn't where the devil and you have a heyday. It's torment. Torment. Read what Jesus says about the man that entered into hell. The rich and the poor man. He didn't enter into hell because he was rich. He entered into hell because he had another God. He didn't want God Almighty. Number six. We not only need those who are solid Christians, but Christians who have discernment and are not being deceived. Some people go to church and they do not even know the Word of God, so they're deceived by the teaching of that church. You're not. One of these is this. If you receive Christ as your Savior and you get off, you're, un, you're lost again, and you have to receive Christ. It's not eternal salvation. It's the lack of it they teach. And the people that go there don't even know that it's not in the Word of God. What God does, He does forever. The gifts and callings of God are without God ever changing His mind. And salvation is a gift of God, lest any man or woman or child should boast. They have no discernment. They will listen and they will say, yes, that sounds good, Pastor, but they can't find it in the Bible. Study to show yourself approved a good workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly, properly, understanding the word of God. So they must not be immature. They must have discernment. They need to know what is of God and what is not of God. Number seven, they need no new revelation who do not have to depend on something or someone else for their happiness. There are two things there. They don't need a new 
a new sign, a new revelation from God. The old salvation sign is all they need. All that they need is not somebody to make them happy. It's Jesus, and he will give them what they need. Number eight is another point. Spiritual strength. Who have been tested and tried and have proven that the very life of God is in them. Have you been tested? Have you been tried? I think most of them here have. But how many times must God have to test and try us? He tests us all our Christian life as he teaches us more and more of his word. He gives us an experience. Do I believe it? Will I live by it? Or will I need to be retaught it? When I was a college professor, there were some students that thought they could study just that night and they could pass the test. I gave them news they didn't like. They failed. I once found that same thing in my, same attitude in my own life as a, a, college, uh, a college student, excuse me. I thought I could do the same thing and found out that I couldn't. I had to take the course again. And they couldn't either. Because you can't just claim you know the word of God. You must really be baptized in the word of God. That simply means immersed in God's word. And you will come out shining when you're immersed. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were immersed in God's word. And they came out shining. Daniel was immersed in God's word. And he came out shining. The people that come out shining and that Jesus says, well done to, they have come out having learned the lesson that God had given them in the scriptures and living by it. Perhaps you can look back at the time when God did something very special in your life. He separated you unto himself and filled you with his spirit. You know he did that. You started out like David, blessed, happy, and successful. You were hungry at that time for the deeper things of God. And you were little in your own eyes, so you let God take over your life. You set your heart to seek the Lord and desired to yield to him completely to his perfect will. But somehow you got off track. You're not quite as dedicated to God as you used to be. So God has sent you a trial to bring you back, back to success, back to life, back to joy, back to happiness. Men of God can already feel, and I do as well, the breath of God's wrath against wickedness in our day. Peace soon will be shattered throughout the earth. My dear friends, when I wrote that statement, Israel had not declared war. She had not been attacked. I thought of Ukraine, and I thought of all the other threatens of war in our world, but now Israel has been attacked once again, and they're fighting for their very existence the days of prophecy are being fulfilled right before your eyes. Don't look at your problems because your problems are to take your mind off witnessing and saving souls through the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is Satan trying to turn us away from our mission to go into all the world and preach the gospel starting where we live. The signs of the times, as the song goes, are everywhere. And most of Christianity doesn't even recognize it. Most of Christianity doesn't. I find no scripture in the Bible that proves that this country will be immune from nuclear attack. Find the scripture that says we'll never be attacked 
if Iran wanted to do it, they would do it even today. They have long, long, uh, the missiles can go this far. Long range, that is the word. Thank you, Lord. Long range missiles. And they could actually do this. North Korea wants to do this to us. They're building more, more weapons. Russia would like to destroy us. Country after country, including China, would like to destroy America. They have not been able to do it from without, but they are doing it from within in our leadership. If you don't fight them, they'll kill you. Would God send fire on the sodomites? Would he do that and allow homosexuality in America to continue without judgment? You know he wouldn't. Would abortion be something God would condemn in another country in another time and not condemn it in America today and the world? Judgment. Are we ready for judgment on this land? Number nine, every day the news gets worse in all areas. Listen to it and you will agree with me. There is a growing sense that something is about to trigger a world conflict. Not a local one, but a world one. Why then do you think the devil's attacking real Christians all over the place to get their attention on the attack instead of recognizing we're in the last days and we better tell people about Christ because there isn't much more time to do that? The issue is turn their attention to their problems and not to their mission as children of God. People today are nervous and they're very, very stressful. The prophet Habakkuk was alarmed by the vision he received of impending wrath on Judah. He saw the signs and he was very concerned. We should see the signs in our country today and be very concerned with it. What he saw coming made his belly tremble, it says, his lips to quiver, and he shook to the bone. Habakkuk 3.16. He saw a time coming, my friends, when all the trees would be stripped. Work would fail. There would be no more cattle, and the fields would be without grass. Perhaps a nuclear explosion? A whirlwind would devour and the earth would be stricken and devoured. He saw that in a vision God gave him for Judah and it bothered him. He didn't say, that's not my business. I'll just go to another country. He said, I must pray and I must proclaim what God told me. I must. Number 10, no matter how dark and hopeless the future, my friends, God's people are to encourage themselves. Encourage yourself every single day in the Lord and rest upon his great and precious promises. David could have allowed himself to be crushed and overwhelmed by his distress. But he did not allow that to happen. He had all the reason in the world to let it happen, but he would not. He would not. Remember, Christ has destroyed the power of Satan. He is the God of this world, small g, but he is a God under the heel of God Almighty. He has been crippled. He's been overestimated, 
and he's been feared instead of challenged by believers in Jesus Christ. Number 11, it is time for us to look at Satan as God sees him, to be aware of what's going on, but also to be aware of what God has already done in Satan's life. He's defeated. He's useless. By the way, he just left. He is without power, and he has no strength. Satan is defeated. He is useless without power and strength. You are more than a conqueror. Act like it. If you've received Christ as your Savior, let it be that you become giants for Jesus Christ. Conquerors because of the blood of Christ. More than a conqueror because of the grace of God. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? Father, we have seen that Satan loves to throw things at us that would cause us, any normal person, to be discouraged. But we've chosen to let you encourage us and strengthen us by your word and tell us devil where to go because we are the children of the most high God. We have the authority of the name of Jesus and he is a defeated foe. Let us say it to him and every time he comes let us tell him how defeated he is and he'll depart from us. Resist the devil and he will flee. He doesn't want to hear that. Father, dear Father in heaven, those that are discouraged today, give them encouragement, supernatural encouragement. Those that see what the devil has thrown at them, may they see what God is bound to do to defeat him in all those things. We thank you, Lord God, for the privilege of following Jesus, the commander and chief, the one who is the victorious one, who has won the battle already, and the, de de the devil is defeated already. And Lord, if somebody's listening to this broadcast and has never received you as their Lord and Savior never said, Jesus, forgive me of my sins and come into my life. I want to follow you the rest of my days. May they defeat the devil who throws questions and question marks at them as to whether this is true or not, and may they receive you right now as their Lord and Savior. And if you are thinking this way, will you say this prayer to God? Dear Father in heaven, forgive me for all the wrong things I have done. Come into my life. I want you to be my Savior, my friend, my God. And I receive you as my burden bearer. And I pray this in the matchless and holy name of God's Son, in Jesus' name, amen. If you've received Christ as your Savior, I invite you to let us know. There's no reason that uh, you wouldn't invite us to let us know. We, we will not contact you unless you ask us to. But what we want to do is we want to pray for you, knowing that you have just received Christ as your Savior. You can write us, if you're in this country of the USA, at The Bible Speaks in Laconia, 40 Belvedere Street, Lakeport, New Hampshire, zip code 03246, or email us by way of the internet at rhornet 2 
at metricast.net. God bless you as you do that.